today I'm going to cover the basics of allocating an asset in Crosslink, how to get into an asset and how to connect one to a form. Then we'll go through the steps of adding an asset and as far as general depreciation and vehicle depreciation, I'll really pull out those differences and we'll look at each of those different types of assets one at a time. So let's take a look at the program here. If we open up Crosslink and we go into a tax return, the first thing that you, you have to come to terms with is Crosslink is a forms-based program. And really what that means is we try to emulate what the forms look like that you get from either the taxpayer or that you fill out from the IRS. So the 1040 and the W-2, they really look like those forms. And that method flows through into adding assets to our, uh, our return, our small businesses. The first thing you have to ask yourself is if you have assets to depreciate, where do you depreciate them to? Are you, do you have a small business? Do you have a rental? What's going on? And to really exemplify that, if we open the add forms, and we go to depreciation, what you can see here is just car and truck. So we all we can do right now is add a vehicle allocation. If we wanted to do a more general depreciation or what I would call a more standard asset rather than a vehicle asset, we have to add the form first. So what we do is add a Schedule C. There it is. We can give it a name here. I'll just name it landscaping. Okay, there's my landscaping. And now when I look at, oh, uh, the other thing I want to point out is you can see that Schedule C over here in the attached forms list. And as you run through the return, as you fill things out and move between the forms, that name jumps in there. So you can, if you have multiple Schedule Cs, somebody has multiple small businesses, you can tell them apart with that description there, right here, principal business or profession. So now also when you look in that depreciation tab, we have a Schedule C here. So what you have to do is really get to the bottom of what they're trying to depreciate and where they're trying to depreciate it. Uh, if it's a small business or maybe it's something more along the lines of like a Schedule E, we can add that as well. Right, and again, it's named over here on the side. So if we look around, there we go. There's, and now when we look in our depreciation much more, there's that Schedule E. So make sure the first thing you do is add the forms. Now why is truck, car and truck, why is that separated from the schedules? Well, it's because we can depreciate this to multiple schedules. So we add those schedules and then inside here we get to choose them. And I'll show you that here in just a second. First, let's focus on a more standard asset. So now that we have a Schedule C attached, we can open it up. We can add new, and we can have a description at the top. So let's say we bought a new computer. Why not? Date placed in service, if you want to change that. And you have a list of all the different codes to choose from down below here. So a computer is going to be code 2. Once you choose that code, you can double click on it or click on the OK down below. You can see it comes up at the very top. And then we just put in how much this computer costs. So we'll say 1200 Now when you enter that, it automatically enters it in the state, whether you need it or not. Just in case you add a state as you're going through, it'll scoop this up here. But now that's basically it for a regular asset. We're going to click Close. We have a bonus depreciation. If you want to elect out of that special depreciation, you can mark this box. I'm just going to click OK here. 
but there's our list now building off the Schedule C of all the assets. So if we look in our Schedule E, there's no nothing there. So all that is connected to that schedule. Much more, if we look at our Schedule C now, here we are, that depreciation flowed right to line 13 here. So again, make sure when you're when you're looking at completing a standard asset that you add the schedule first. And then you can double click to enter that schedule, new asset. Uh, let's say we bought um, um, landscaping software. <laughs> Why not? Right. So here's software. Okay. How much did that cost us? Now notice at the bottom we have these buttons. So if something happens out of service, casualty, sale, whatever, we can use those tools down below. Now another thing that happens is if you're in here by mistake, let's say you're in here and oh, now you know you're not, allowed, you're not you don't want to be in here. So we'll click close and OK. But it makes us fill this out. Notice also, though, it says if this is an invalid asset, that we'll want to delete that asset to get out of here. So if you're stuck inside, you're, you're in here by mistake, what you want to do is click Delete Asset. And that lets you out of that. Allows you to return to that list. OK, so that is a standard asset. That's an asset that gets written off to just one schedule. When you have something that is a, a vehicle asset, um, those vehicles can be written off to multiple schedules at once. So what happens is you have the ability to double click here, we'll new asset, here's our vehicle name. So let's say it's a Ford F-150, that's a popular vehicle other day placed in service but notice now we don't have to wade through all of those other codes these are just the ones associated with the vehicle so I'll say light duty truck click OK and now this looks vastly different than the other standard asset window that we were in so it's not just asking for an amount it's also asking for these questions to be answered. And if you try to move off of this general tab, you'll get error messages that want you, that are basically trying to guide you through entering things before you move on. Because these things determine how the depreciation for this asset works, right? So before we can enter mileage and expenses, we need to enter a cost. So let's, uh, how much is this? Uh, Let's get a nice one, 35 grand, right? So there we go. And now still, if, if I want to move off this tab, it'll tell me, make sure you answer these questions first before we can show you anything else. So these questions down below and this cost here must be answered before we can move on. Was the vehicle available for personal use? Sure. More than 5% owner? Yeah. Is another vehicle available? Yes. Do you own this vehicle? Yes. OK, and now we have these two force buttons here. Notice we can say, do we want to force the actual expenses, or do we want to force Crosslink to calculate standard mileage above everything else? So if you're in a situation where you're, you're filling something out and submitting something for like a truck driver or a taxi cab driver, those guys don't get paid for mileage. Uh, they don't get to write off their mileage because they get paid as part of their job for that. So you can, in those cases, you can force Crosslink to ignore any mileage that would be entered and just act, calculate the actual expenses. I want to say no to both of these. I don't want to force either one of these. And what will happen is Crosslink will figure out what's the best way 
to get the, the largest refund. So whichever way, whichever method, it'll allow you to enter both. Whichever method gets the most refund, that's the way that, that the, that the uh, asset's going to be calculated. And last but not least, we have this. The question here usually is, why is this grayed out? And that has to do with the date placed in service. So we're completing a tax return for this tax year. And it's asking for um, things that were used in a previous tax year. So be careful here. If, if it was date placed in service was in a prior year, then we would be able to select these here. Now that these questions are answered and we have the amount entered, we can click on this mileage and expenses tab. And we, once we take a look here, this top section is about entering the miles. And the bottom section is about entering actual expenses. And then these two check boxes down here have to do with your due diligence requirements, just to kind of make sure that um, when you take care of things that you're actually getting them written down and you're capturing those things here. So to start off with, at the very top, since I want the program to calculate the best way and allow me to enter both. I'm going to enter both. So total vehicle miles, we'll put 10,000. Commute, we'll go ahead and put 2,000. Now you can enter a total commute for the whole year, or you can enter a daily amount. You don't necessarily need to enter both. If they don't know one, you can ask them how far it is to their, to their office. And get that entered at the top. Now notice, before, I, the reason we had these separated from vehicle and the regular assets is because we can write off miles and ex car vehicle expenses to multiple schedules. So you can see here, those reflect those schedules that I, I added, a Schedule C and a Schedule E. So I'm going to go ahead and write off all that up there. And we can go ahead and enter some actual expenses, oil, gas, and repairs. You know, not a whole lot. Parking and tolls. Tolls actually add up pretty quickly. Rental, yada, yada. You want to make sure that, again, you're getting that evidence and that it's written down. And you can store scans of those things in our document archive attach that to the tax return, and you don't have to go looking somewhere else, have it in a digital format, you can save yourself some money uh, going paperless. So now that all that stuff's entered, we can take a look at how things were depreciated. Oh, what's this? So we have an error message here that's telling us that the miles we wrote off are more than we have available to us up here. Right, so I did all 10,000, but if we know our tax theory, we know that commute miles can't be included in this 10,000. That's something that has to be subtracted. So I actually only have 8,000 to deal with. Now, do these numbers have to add up to perfectly to 10,000 or 8,000? No, and the reason for that is we talked about having this available for personal use. So even though they may have put 10,000 miles on the car, they were picking up groceries and maybe grabbing the kids after school. So those things don't have to add up uh, depending on how you answer these questions. So just, like I said, just be careful there and take this one step at a time. And now we can get out of there. There's our truck. Return to list close. And if we look at, let's look at our Schedule E this time. If we look down here, oh, there's our auto expenses. And if we look at our Schedule C, there's our auto, and there's our, our um, computer. So as you can see, it's fairly easy once you get this down with the things that you want to do first is add those forms. 
So if the forms don't appear, make sure they have been added to the tax return. And again, you can name these differently. So you can tell multiple Schedule C's and multiple Schedule E's and so forth apart. Once you're in here, if you're in here by mistake, make sure you delete the asset to get out of here. Because close is going to make you feel like you're stuck. You know, oh, I get this error message and I can't get out of here. Make sure you're deleting. And as far as vehicle assets go, the things you want to really focus on is completing the cost, answering the questions, remembering if you answer no to these two, that the, the Crosslink software will figure out the best way. And that leaves you with just entering your information up top here. There we go. Now we have, oh, I didn't name that vehicle. That's what I get. You can just go back in there. What did we get? Um, Honda Civic. There we go. Named it. All right. That is, in a nutshell, adding a, a, an, an asset to a tax return. And again, make sure you add them first and that you fill each of those screens out as you go through, and everything will flow through just perfectly fine.